we are putting a lot of care and love and energy into this so that you don't have to and you can just like use it and set it you don't have to do anything to it and it's always just kind of gonna work Hey everybody, welcome back to the Jesse Nyberg podcast. Today I'm here with James from Ono oh Type Co, super talented type designer and owner of the Foundry. How are you doing, man? I'm good, Jesse. How are you? Not bad, not bad. Uh, been a pretty chill week so far. What have you kind of been up to? Well, I just found out my kid's nanny got COVID. So that's what, yeah. That's what, do you have kids, Jesse? No, I do not have any. Hey, yeah, well, that, that that's why it's been a chill week for you, I guess. Yeah, it has, exactly. I don't think it's been a chill. I wouldn't say it's been a chill week for me. I'm trying to go back and think about when was the last chill week. And I think it was like four years ago or something like that. Yeah, so you've just been going since then. Parent mode, you know? Yeah. That's what's How long, up. Your kids are about that age? Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, I have a daughter that's four and I have another daughter that's 15 months. It's crazy. It's crazy. Do you want to have kids? Yeah, it's just, I really do, but it seems like every time you talk to someone, they lead with something like that rather than like how wonderful <laughs> it is, you know? I will say there have been some moments where I'm just kind of like looking at these kids and I'm like, Oh my God, you are so amazing. Just like yeah. the little things, the little connections you see happening in, in their brain or like, I just look at her like from the other room and she's like sitting at her little kid table, like coloring or they're yeah. playing together. They're starting to play together right now. And that's just the best thing in the world. And I think some parents say like, oh, it's really rewarding. Like having kids is yeah. rewarding. I don't know if that would be my go-to word to describe the experience i think it's just the the most difficult thing that i've ever <laughs> been tasked with and yeah. so we're still like in the thick of it and and will be for many years to come um but we're surviving it i remember talking to the type designer ben keel like mm -hmm. the first year of having kids and Ben was like, yeah, your only goal is survival now. Like you're just trying to survive. <laughs> yeah. So that's what it feels like is, and is, and we are surviving, you know, cause what is the option? What's the other option? Um, right. But I of course would recommend it <laughs> if you are the person that's like, I cannot imagine a future without having kids. If you're like, yeah. eh, kids like would be would be nice, but kind of maybe I'm good without it. I would say absolutely do not have kids. Like, yeah, I think that's a that probably applies to a lot of things, too, where you're like, if it's an absolutely 100 percent, yes, then then go ahead and do it. And if it's not, maybe find something that is that 100 percent. Yes, for you. You know what I mean? Right. I feel that way even about like design and a lot of like creative careers. Like if you don't care about it a lot, it's a lot easier to just make good money doing something more boring. That's maybe <laughs> like easier, you know? Well, I think there's a lot of careers in design or in graphic design specifically that are necessary and, and maybe not the most uh, like challenging creatively, but are mm. still in the design world and, and still allow for a lot of uh, unique problem solving or, or working with uh, cool, talented people that you respect and enjoy and stuff. And yeah, I think being creative is, um, is really hard and, and maybe a little bit overrated um, but actually just being like a part of a cool team that you like mm -hmm. is, is really like more fun most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the grass is always greener too. Like when I was working as an employee, I, all I wanted to do was be like a freelancer and do my own thing. And like, after doing that for a while, I'm like, it seems pretty nice to get like that same paycheck every time and like just work on something. And you know, if there's a problem, it's not just you having to solve it like by yourself. Yeah, getting a paycheck, getting health insurance, 401k, if your company's going to match the 401k, I mean, all of a sudden being an employee sounds pretty good. And I'm in a kind of similar boat um, until I realized that I'm actually not qualified to work 
anywhere. Like I can't, <laughs> I can't go get a job now. I'm, I'm at the point where I'm officially like no safety net, you know, because nowhere mm-hmm. would hire me with the skill set that I have because it's way too specific. You know, I can do one thing, and and that's run uh, a small uh, type foundry. Yeah, like, that's it. That's my only move. Right. Yeah. That the far the further you get into your own like little niche, the farther you get from being like uh, marketable to like a you know giant company or whatever. What what did you uh, like? What kind of then got you interested in that? Like obsessed with type design and all that in the first place? Because you probably had a normal background just like as a designer, right? Yeah. I mean, I think so. Pretty pretty much. You know, went to design yeah. school and stuff. But um, I always just thought, like when we had to do a poster um, project in school, for instance, or, or anything, it always just kind of felt m- like more of a unique challenge or a, a more of a kind of fun prompt to think about the whole poster and doing everything on it. So either like a hand lettered poster mm. or, um, you know, if it if it has a photo on it, then like you took the photo or if there's illustration, you drew it, you know, just mm-hmm. like owning everything on a single image is a fun thing to think about. And that is often the work that I respond to. There's also like the kind of selectorial art of graphic design where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to grab this font and I'm going to grab that style illustration or that Mm -hmm. I'm going to work with that photographer, kind of more art director kind of thing. And I just was never really good at that. Like I just kind of wanted to do it all. Um, Yeah. Even if it came out like worse, I would rather it come out worse and own a hundred percent of it. If that makes sense. Mm, Like even the little type, like even just like the stuff at the footer or whatever. Um, it just became kind of a fun challenge to do every part of it. And my school really encouraged that. Like they didn't let us use anyone else's photo photos or even if we were working on like a website project, like we had to draw all the icons and, and stuff like that. Mm. And that was cool. I'm really glad that they made that a requirement of that kind of course. Um, Cause it forced us to try all those things and, and see yeah. what we like. Like I don't really like photography. I'm not really, good at that it's not my thing drawing and illustration i think is really fun but it's just like so hard and takes forever and that's not really my background but i just kind of came into lettering as like oh this feels like the most kind of natural sort of path uh for me so i went from lettering into type design and then very quickly i was like having my own type foundry would be the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. That, that, that was the coolest thing that I could possibly imagine while I was in school. And so it just became my uh, obsession, like you said. That's cool. When you uh, first started it, like uh, when you said in your mind, you know, like, oh, I want to have a type foundry. Like, how would you figure out like what the steps would be to actually like getting that done? And what was like the first thing you did to kind of get that wheel moving that's a good question jesse um trying to go back in my mind so i had a very gradual introduction and um the first thing was to figure out how fonts are made you know Mm -hmm. font lab was the software at that time which is like an archaic kind of type design software i think i was on font lab four or font lab five or something. Mm. Um, but anyways, getting comfortable with that and just like starting to understand all the different parts of the of type design, like mechanics, you know, um, that was step one. And then arriving at like a first kind of finished font kind of was step number two. And for me, there are two fonts I did very early on. One was called Duke and one was called Wisdom Script. And then I uh, sent them both to a kind of 
new version of a type foundry that was starting up at that time called Lost Type. And they were working on this mm. like pay what you want business model. Yeah. And that just felt great because I was like, well, these things are like maybe as good as I can get them for now with my skill set, but maybe not quite perfect or just didn't feel right to have it be like in a standard release on my fonts or whatever. Yeah. So I sent them to Lost Type and luckily they were accepted and um, shout out to Riley Cran, who was the guy running that um, running Lost Type at the time. And um, that was my gateway into actually making money from type design. So that was like step three was kind of getting exposed to this thing as like a viable career, mm. you know? And then step four was getting as good at it as I possibly could. Um, so going to grad school, I went to the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague, Netherlands. They have a program called Type Media. Oh, That's wow. just a year long master's program in type design only. So it's like type design boot camp. That's cool. So yeah, got the master's degree and then came home and um, I forget where we are in the number of steps, but then it was like basically time to set up an LLC and yeah. um, get the first version of the website up and running, which was running on Big Cartel, which is like Shopify or something like that. Like it's not really meant to sell fonts, but it can yeah. kind of work if you figure it out. And then... That launched in um, like August of 2015, and we've just kind of been improving since then. So that's yeah. cool. That's cool to hear that you started on Big Cartel. I use them just to sell like prints and stuff. It's pretty like yeah, pretty basic like you're saying. But it's crazy to hear you say that because I always look at your website now and like I think it looks really cool, and I love how everything's kind of very like um has like a lot of motion to it and everything's just kind of like oh shit like look at all this stuff to look at <laughs> and that's definitely a lot more custom you know than just like a gridded right. out shopify site or whatever yeah at some point we graduated to uh an actual custom website that's like designed for fonts you know yeah and, and selling fonts is kind of complicated and all the different licensing requirements and stuff like that but that was a huge milestone that was like in 2018 where I was like, okay, it's time to pay actual money to like work with someone that can help us build mm -hmm. the thing because my web skills were nowhere near where they needed to be. I tried to do it myself at the beginning. It was just not happening. Um, but yeah, we worked with this company in Portland called Oof Studio mm. and uh, they just did an amazing job and we continued to improve the site like every year we'll kind of add new features to the site or, or new capabilities and we're finally at a place with it now where i'm i'm really stoked with it and um we'll just continue kind of tweaking it and stuff from here but hopefully not rebuilding anything from scratch for a while yeah yeah i was looking into it a little bit more too before the call and i i didn't notice this when i would first just look at the fonts but i really like how you kind of write um about like the process and kind of the story that went into like I was reading the thing that you did with Hobo and like how you found the because I always knew about it and then I always saw that you had the like uh, modified like new version and I always wondered you know exactly what like what it was because at first glance you don't notice like how ugly it is and then when you put it <laughs> next to it with the like actual like all the curves that you redrew I was like holy shit he actually had to go in there and I think that that stuff seems to have happened with a lot of the fonts when they switched them from like print to digital that they just didn't do it well back in like the 80s or 90s or whatever. Yeah, I mean, uh, now we're used to like a certain level of drawing quality. And if you go back 30 years or even more, I think is when the first digital fonts were getting worked on. Um, yeah. They were just figuring all that stuff out for the first time. And they were just honestly stoked to have anything mm -hmm. in a digital format, you know? Um, right. But now our, our standards for everything have gone way, way up and character sets and open type features and every, all the sorts of bells and whistles have gotten a lot more complicated but 
at its core, you know, it, it's still the same technology essentially that they were working on decades yeah. ago. But yeah, that was a fun project. I like writing process articles. I think that's a, an important part of kind of the marketing of the typeface is telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just something that was always, the importance of that was always stressed in whatever school I was going to. First CCA in San Francisco for my um, undergrad. And then in, in type media is the same thing. It's like, you always kind of had to tell a story. So I was just like very used to like doing that at the end yeah. of the project. It's like looking back and, and, and telling the story of it, just like in a very mechanical kind of way, just like, here are the steps that I took basically. And yeah, now I'm, I'm really happy to have an archive of all of those things. I kind of want to like publish them in a book or something like That'd that because cool. all the content is is there already but uh it i i sometimes think i'd kind of get into the weeds on that stuff like it's maybe a mm -hmm. little bit more technical than people actually care to read but the subtext is always like this is why fonts cost money you know what i mean like yeah we we are putting a lot of care and love and energy into this so that you don't have to and you can just like use it and set it you don't have to do anything to it and it's always just kind of going to work and it's going right. to have the sort of capabilities that you're looking for it to have um and that's that's why we charge uh what we charge for fonts you know it's not a free mm -hmm. font was it the you mentioned you went to the school here and then the other one was in the netherlands when mm -hmm. you were going to those two different schools i know one was only the year long like masters thing but mm -hmm. how different was like the actual like schooling system from being over there and over here? Um, there are a couple of big differences. One uh, that I loved about Type Media is that we just had a desk. We had a physical space at school mm. that had all of our stuff. And it was just like showing up to that desk was kind That's of cool. um, just a place where we could live. Whereas, you know, in undergrad, it was like we had a shared studio space where everyone could just kind of hang out with their laptop. But I was always jealous of the architecture kids and, and the interior yeah. design kids that had like their specific desk that was like their domain for the entire year or whatever. Um, so that was cool. And I mean, there are massive cultural differences between the Netherlands and San Francisco. Um, in, in a way, it was super different. And, and in a way, it was kind of not so different like i've also spent like a, a tiny bit of time in uh in alabama mm -hmm. visiting my friend and i was like oh man the difference between san francisco and alabama is actually a lot more than the <laughs> difference between san francisco and that the makes Hague, sense. for instance but uh yeah the weather was different and it was rainy all the time and everyone rode bikes everywhere because it's holland and stuff so Mm. It was it was some degree of culture shock for sure. And I was very homesick too. Like that was a really, it was a very, very hard year. And it was a grueling year of just like working around the clock and, and being truly obsessed and in this environment where everyone is obsessed. And yeah. you kind of get this overinflated sense of how important the work you're doing is, mm -hmm. which really helps, you know? Like if you think something is really important um then i think you're more likely to to put in the time on it you know right so what i wanted to ask you i was watching the uh one of your videos on instagram of your dad like reviewing the different fonts <laughs> and like giving them all the ratings and stuff and i i thought that was like super funny and i like that you just put that stuff on there and uh has your like dad and family and everything always been like pretty supportive like that of all the stuff you're doing and like type and things uh yeah i i think so i'm i'm pretty uh lucky i think in the parents and family department um i think they are all very confused by what i was interested in just because it's kind of an obscure kind of niche mm -hmm. and stuff but um when i started making money from it they got a lot more 
okay about it, you know, when they, yeah, yeah, yeah. when they saw that it's actually like a viable job and stuff, then I didn't really need to do any more convincing. Um, and you know, my, my dad is super sweet. My mom is really sweet too, but she doesn't like being on camera as much as my dad. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, yeah, they're, they're totally encouraging. I would say I'm very lucky in the parents' apartment and, uh, I have five older brothers. So I'm, Oh wow. I think it's just kind of cool to grow up in a big family and be exposed to a lot of stuff in that way. But, uh, yeah, my brothers have always been kind and supportive and, and kind of like mentors, um, to a point, you know, mm -hmm. like there's some, there's a point at which where I was like, okay, there's not really a, a clear path for me to follow with one of my brothers. Like no one else right. wanted to go to art school or anything like that. So kind of early on, I had to figure it out and, um, but yeah, they're, they're great. And, and my dad's great. And you can just put a, a camera on him and he'll go, you know? So I love yeah. that. I love that about him. And he's just kind of like comfortable in that way. And I think he likes being documented as he's yeah, getting yeah. kind of towards the end of his life. He's like 74, I think something mm. like that. So average lifespan of a man what is that 76 or something like that so i, I have no idea but that sounds right he's starting to think about his mortality and and his mm -hmm. legacy and i think the more camera time he gets he's just like okay yeah. cool i'm i'm going on record this is my vibe you know what i mean right what kind of um, work did he do? Because I'm curious always like what people's parents do and how that influences like their career it's, decisions. It's funny. Um, he was a public school, uh, high school English teacher. And okay. um, and my mom was uh, a stay at home mom. And like that's that's not a really happening salary. You know, um, right. we weren't wealthy growing up but we inherited a house when my grandmother died and mm. so we had like the house thing taken care of so i never That's felt nice. like yeah it was huge huge for us i never felt like we were strapped or anything like that but my older brothers who my oldest brother is 16 years older than i am he definitely did he felt like he really grew up poor and my two oldest brothers were like super motivated to make money and and they've both been extremely successful um and i think i just kind of grew up without the money making pressure on in a big way and so it's easier to start thinking about a career in graphic design <laughs> at that point i guess i yeah. don't know like i absolutely just like incredibly lucky to kind of grow up the the way that i did in a nice part of california mm -hmm. or a, a decent part of california but uh yeah pretty quickly got up to the bay area and just liked it up here and and stayed up here and stuff but um yeah my dad was was an english teacher but the thing he always says is like i shouldn't have been an english teacher like i did it mm. for 40 years and was never really super passionate uh about it and it wasn't really where my wow. interest was it's just kind of like what he ended up doing for whatever reason and he should he says he should have been uh a designer of kitchen appliances or like an industrial designer or something mm -hmm. like that because he's passionate about kitchens and appliances and <laughs> washer washing machines and dishwashers and yeah coffee grinders he's obsessed with like vintage coffee grinders so he has like all these like really strong passions that he just absolutely did not follow at all in his mm. career and um i think he kind of sees me as you know the opposite end of the spectrum where i just kind of yeah. figured out a way to to make a living out of out of the stuff that I'm really stoked on, you know, which is this right. very much a an idea of our generation, you know, is that we should get into the stuff that we're passionate about and make a job out of it. 
Like, yeah, it sounds kind of obvious when you say it like that, but it's also like a relatively new idea for some people. For sure. Yeah. I think the, there's like, uh, some of the older generation, like they, uh, are worried. Like some of it comes from like a, a good thing, like, Oh, I don't know if that's going to work out. But I think also some of them are maybe thinking, damn, I wish I kind of did that. You know, I just did this job instead when I really wanted to, you know, be an artist or do this or whatever it may be. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it just kind of comes down to, to what your mindset is. And it's really hard to operate from an abundance mindset if you're growing up and you're strapped, you know? Yeah, for sure. What, what, um, I've never really talked like lengthy with anyone who runs like a type foundry or creates fonts, like at the kind of scale that I feel like you're at. And I was curious what your kind of daily or like morning routine is as like just a work day for you. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, how it's been lately is I start the day with a call with our admin, whose name is mm -hmm. Jamie and she is fantastic. And she just kind of wanted to work in type design in some capacity. And she has this experience of doing like a lot of, um, admin work basically. Mm -hmm. And so I, I start every day with her. She lets us know if there's any like customer support questions that she has on her end. And she tells me what um, other stuff she's working on. And sometimes that'll be type production stuff because she's kind of starting to get into that side of it. So like adding accented characters and working on kerning for existing fonts and, and mm. proofing things as they're getting closer to done. Um, so now it's kind of like I'll I'll start things a lot of uh, a lot of the time, or, or pretty much all the time is it's kind of like an idea that I begin with, and then mm -hmm. gradually start working with her on it. That's so nice. that's yeah that's just my morning meeting with her. Um, but I'm so grateful to her for taking care of the uh, customer support stuff. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> It's just a steady flow of email, you know, and I just got to a point mm -hmm. where I was like, I can't have email be my life's work. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to make every effort I can to be free of email, you know? Um, yeah, that makes sense. so she's, uh, she's allowing for that. And it's just the best money that we spend, you know? Um, and then sometimes there'll be a meeting. Um, we're doing a couple of client gigs right now and so just kind of hmm. keeping tabs on those either getting like a little presentation ready for those or, or meeting with clients that are in the custom type world you know like uh at least entertaining the idea of building a custom typeface like yeah. a lot of times we'll just kind of do projects like that as a kind of like precursor to actually working on the custom typeface to just to explore mm. the possibilities for them. Um, I try and do some amount of drawing uh, during the day, just um, kind of fleshing out different ideas all at different stages. Right now we have probably like four or five projects that are all at various levels of completion. Mm. Some of them are, are really close and some are like a ways off, but there's always kind of something to do or figure out with them. Um, and then the kind of marketing side, which is, you know, writing newsletters or doing some amount of social media or yeah. figuring out like, like working on a process article, like we talked about, um, creating specimens, you know, that's kind of like the rest of the day is, is all the stuff that I would say just belongs to the the visibility or marketing side of the business. So it's like, yeah. it's just basically two things. It's working on the library or working on the visibility. And mm -hmm. I enjoy both. Um, and before I know it, it's 4.45 and time to get my daughter Loretta from daycare and shut it down for the day. So it's just, it's very much like an 8.30 to 4.45 day. Mm every day so since you have that like hard daycare appointment that helps you like be like all right i had to finish right for the it day is the, it's the best it's the best thing for 
you know, they say there's Parkinson's law, which says that uh, any task is going to expand or contract to fill the amount of time that you give it. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times that 445 stop time is just like, okay, I know I have this time. What can I do with it? So in a good day, I'll, you know, have that um, front of mind as I'm kind of planning things out and, and trying to be reasonably productive. And of course, mm -hmm. I have plenty of bad days where I'm not thinking about that stuff and 445 comes, I'm like, oh my God, I didn't do anything today. Yeah. Or I, didn't, I didn't get anything meaningful done. Um, I had no billable time today. Um, and maybe even like font sales were kind of low that day or whatever. Mm. And that's a, that's a terrible feeling where when you own the business, you're like, oh shit, you know, like that was a waste. And our right. time is so precious with kids and everything. I can't believe I wasted a day. Um, and then when you're an employee, I remember having days like that as an employee and just thinking like, this is well, awesome. <laughs> try again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It just doesn't hurt in the same way that it does. When, so there's a million great things about being a freelancer or running your own thing in whatever way that is for you. Right. But I think the big bummer is that you feel uh, useless um, on certain days where you just don't kind of get into a flow with whatever you're doing. And you're like, oh my God, I cannot believe yeah. I'm wasting time right now. For sure. You're more attached to it because it's you like, you know, doing everything or not, maybe not everything, but more of the core things. Like people ask me sometimes, like some of my friends that aren't really in design or freelance or anything, like how do you stay motivated to um, do your work every day? Like I work at this job. If I do it by myself, like I would be lazy or whatever. And I try to explain like, well, if I don't do it, like it only affects me badly. No one else gets like hurt by it. So it's like, that's the motivation is wanting to you actually feel like when you do a lot, it actually moves it forward. And when you do a little, it moves it that not at all or backwards. Yeah. Now, are you, would you say that you're a person that is reasonably self-motivated in that way? And it's not yeah. hard for you to tap into that sort of discipline? A hundred percent. I don't know why, but like, I'm definitely grateful for it. Cause I have people tell me like, I could never, you know, or how do you, that's really hard for you. But I think it, I think it maybe came from some kind of, you know, like chip on my shoulder, like underdog thing. Like, oh, I could do this, you know, like I'll just put uh, in the work. That's my only maybe explanation for it, you know? Uh, yeah, I think I'm the same way. Like it's, it's really pretty easy for me um, to finish things or mm -hmm. like I have this belief about myself, just like you have your, this belief about yourself and like, why is it there? I have no idea, but right. like one thing is I'm a finisher. Like I will get something to the finish line, uh, even though it might not be a hundred percent perfect or there's always room for improvement, but whatever, I'm a finisher. And the other thing is like, I'm a fairly high output creative. Like I, mm -hmm. I will get a lot of stuff out the door and I'm fast, you know? Yeah. And I think these beliefs about ourselves, like, where do they even come from? I don't know I either, no idea. <laughs> but it, it doesn't matter. It's like, if they're there, they're there. And if you're that sort of person that can be self-disciplined, um, it's a, it's a superpower for sure. And it lines up to being a freelancer or having your own business very well. If you're not that yeah. sort of person, I'd say stay with that w2 job you got going on you know yeah i definitely agree too i don't know where it comes from because uh, some of my other like fellow designers too will ask me uh how do you do all these other things like how do you do freelance the you know post things on instagram do the podcast do the youtube videos like how do you do it all in a week and i i try to think like what an explanation is other than just I guess scheduling it correctly and just every day working no matter if I think something's like I try not to I try to look at everything like it has to be done it's not like oh yeah. I'll do these sometimes because if you do them sometimes you'll never do them at all right so yeah you're a finisher and yeah. uh yeah it's just like 
you kind of get used to that level of output. And then mm-hmm. when you slip on it, it starts feeling bad, you know? Yeah. Or, or that's how it is for me, at least. And I think sometimes if you're at a bigger company, things can move slower. So you kind of get used to the speed at which they mm. go. Um, so you're like, well, you know, we got this and this out the door this week. Maybe it wasn't that much, but it was like a lot more than the week before or whatever. Right. So we're, we're kind of, we're used to that clip. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm used to a pretty high clip, I think. And it's, that's, that's what good. feels good to me. What, um, uh, I was curious cause if so for your like kind of collection of fonts, I really like obviously, and I really like Chi and Ekman Psych. I think those were the three <laughs> that I kind of, you know, uh-huh. discovered. And I was curious, what would you say was the, what has sold the most? I, I was always curious Degular. about that. Defi- definitely Degular, which is our, our, mm grotesque thing is basically that's me interesting trying. i i thought i've learned a lot about what sells in this journey and degular is at the top for us it's the thing that i see used more often yeah in like a it's corporate good. kind of setting it's where all the big licenses come you know like every once in a while we'll sell like uh, a really a really good one and that'll make up you know some percentage of our income for the year and uh everything else with a couple of exceptions like obviously is a decent seller for us too um which is also a grotesque like it's it's crazy the bias that buyers have towards grotesques i cannot Mm. explain it and we did this project retail which i thought was uh good (laughs) and like very few people buy it. It's the same exact like family structure as Degular as far as mm. like textiles and display styles and a range of weights and italics and similar open type features and everything like that is exactly the same. The only difference is the terminals are kind of open on, on retail and the terminals mm. are very close. Like if you imagine a, a C, a letter yeah. C, something like that. So that is like, it's, it's arguably more expressive retail is, but it is crazy. Like regular outsells retail, like 30 to one or something. Wow. And they required the same amount of work. So then as a business owner, I'm like, God, what am I, what do I do here? Like yeah. the, the business thing would just be like, okay. Degular like two. <laughs> yeah, Degular <laughs> two, electric boogaloo. Let's see what that yeah. looks like. And then Degular 3 and 4 and 5 and some um, foundries, you start to see that. And mm. I think before I would kind of roll my eyes at it and just be like, oh my God, kind of, you know, right. do, do something a little bit more creative here. And now I'm like, everyone's playing by the same rules. This is the kind of current landscape that we're in. This is what buyers are looking for. So of course you're going to see that kind of genre flooded, you know? Right. That makes sense. The degular thing. Cause I was looking at it, I guess maybe from like a pure designers, like which display more fonts they like, but yeah, if someone buys a, the degular family for their whole like brand and that's going to be their like system font, that's a huge license versus me and all my friends buying, like obviously to use on a, a poster or whatever. You got it. That's exactly it. I think the corporate potential is like the kind of big thing that we're talking about. All right, so yeah. I'm, I'm just pulling this up now because I, I like to look at this stuff because I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, the stats, exactly. I'm curious about it. So in 2022 so far, Degular is 36% of our, um, oh, damn. of our income from our website. So this is just looking at retail sales on our website. Yeah and obviously is 18%. So that's a a distant second, you know, roughly half of um, the regular money coming in. And now, since you also mentioned uh, Ekman Psych, I'll check that out. 
percent of sales 1.12 percent of sales wow. so i like, see it everywhere on like merch design and clothing i would think it would be a, a bigger maybe it just lives in that world only or something yeah and this is all uh, I, we also distribute our typefaces through adobe that's so true. that's a that's a different set of numbers and i could pull that stuff up too if you're curious so on adobe ekman psych is three percent of sales like it's significantly more but still no that's just near. downloads is that how that one is basically or activations or whatever you they call it it, it used to be uh activations and now it is actually usage in adobe documents is how they calculate it it's kind oh, of damn unclear exactly how they calculate that but it's like right. yeah you have to use the fonts to actually get the royalty on it now but adobe is is different all over the place like our obviously data is showing that's like 30 percent of our adobe money coming in whereas mm. Dengler is 17. but the point is grotesque just dominate in this way that's crazy and never would have predicted the numbers would be so clear in that respect yeah. and everything else is you know chi and blaze face or or fat face and and hobo like they're all around two or three percent like they're all very small um i've seen blaze face a lot at trader joe's they yeah. use it on like some of their cheesecake and stuff oh, like that. Yeah, someone, <laughs> someone at, I, I heard one time that Trader Joe's designers, there's only two of them that do They're dope, whoever all it is. The, they have two graphic designers for every single Trader Joe's product. And it's they crazy. do like a package a day or something like that. They mm. have to do like one new SKU every day that they work. I think that would be a very fun job to have, but um, they do. Yeah, an they're they're pretty. Props to them because a lot of their shit looks pretty dope compared to a lot of things you see at like the giant, uh, like you know, like a Vons or or whatever. Dude, a Trader Joe's goes the full gamut. You see some stuff that's just like, how, what yeah, is going true. on here, and then other stuff is great, and it's probably different people or whatever working at different times. But it's right. a, remarkable that they have a grocery store of one brand. Like you're not going to find any other brands yeah. in the whole store and everything looks different. Or I guess they sell beer and wine and chocolate and stuff from wherever. It's only like, like the, yeah, or like the sauces, you know, it's very like limited, I feel like. But it, it looks like it's all these different, like it looks like a grocery store where yeah. it does it's actually like an Aldi or an Ikea or something like that. Right. You know? Yeah. I'd be curious to find out who, who does that stuff. They'd be a cool episode. That'd be a on cool the interview. Podcast. That'd be a good episode. Yeah. yeah. I'd listen to it for sure. Yeah. As a, uh, uh, in our type design class, we had a student who was just a signage person at um, mm. Trader Joe's. So every Trader Joe's store has two sign people working. Yeah. At it. Those are dope too. Yeah. She was good. That's awesome. cool. They, they're pretty good at keeping that look the same too throughout if it's all those different people doing it because it looks, you know, you go to one in one city and the other city, it has that same yeah. hand painted yeah, feel and it's all they're cohesive. They're the Trader Joe's vibe. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> I'm into it. Yeah. What, um, I, you mentioned the Adobe thing. I wanted to ask like how much of an impact do you think that had on the like business overall because i believe i oh, found i found out about it through there i think obviously adobe fonts was my first like introduction to you yeah it's huge dude it's it's um i forget what our first royalty checks were looking like from adobe but we only had like 13 styles on there like we had hobo hobo rokuko and and maybe like one other thing just to start with yeah. And they pay quarterly. So the first check I got, I was like, okay, this is this is not much, but it's something. And what yeah. would happen if we kind of put a lot of energy into this and, and getting our library on Adobe more complete and just every quarter it started getting to be more and more to the point where it was allowing for some stability in our business. Like, Every freelancer or anyone who runs a company is just looking for stability. Yeah. And 
what I found out is that Adobe does a ton for my mental health. Like it's a, it's a <laughs> yeah. big deal to kind of have your needs met with that. And it allows us to focus on these other things that we just kind of like want to try and see how they go. And maybe they're more experiments mm. and stuff, but, um, it's great. I love the team there. They've been so helpful to me. They could be so much worse. Like, they could mm. be really awful. And I think they would still have foundries kind of lining up to to take part in them because it's passive income yeah. to some degree. Or like the fonts are done anyway, so just like getting them on there. Um, but so the trade-off's worth it? Like the maybe not selling f- as much because people can get them for free versus like the exposure and the royalties and stuff? Uh, yeah, I don't even think it's a, an exposure thing necessarily or that's not how I've been looking at it. But it, 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 I guess it is exposure in some way. Like the fonts yeah. are getting used and the more they get used, the more they kind of become a part of the visual culture and the more people will look to use them. And a lot of foundries go without that uh, entirely you know clem dynamo sharp grilly commercial they're all off adobe and they're all killing it you know right so like you don't need to be there to thrive clearly but Mm -hmm. i think it's harder uh essentially it's harder to kind of like stand out and and be super visible and be a destination foundry yeah you know rather I think the than- visual culture thing helps too like you were saying because i know people who basically only use ones they can get from adobe fonts whether it's a mon- monetary issue or they just like how it's all in one place or they don't want to deal with licenses or whatever like that's a huge i think especially I, from people i've talked to my age a huge factor and like if you're not on there it may be uh people won't know about it that are using it or whatever. Cause I, I, I love using Adobe fonts cause it's pretty easy just to run through the whole website and like just click activate on shit. Yep. And it's Spotify model, you know, it's subscription. Yeah. You're, it's already paid for, you have to pay for, or you don't have to, but a lot of designers are paying for it already. And right. I think the whole creative cloud bill, whatever it is monthly for you, it's worth it just for the fonts alone, you know? Like yeah, that's, yeah. that's a remarkable deal just looking at the fonts. Um, I've thought about like, is there a, some sort of subscription play I could make with businesses or something like that? If I could get hooked up with like Moo or like Paperless right. Post or something like that and they could pay a subscription fee to license our fonts. I think that would make a lot of sense for them um, mm-hmm. And it could be a great thing for us too, but then it's a whole account that we have to manage and keep track of and everything. Whereas just like being on Adobe just makes it so easy for people for all the reasons that you mentioned already. How old are you, Jesse? I'm 24. 24, just a, yeah. just a wee little kid. Okay, I'm exactly <laughs> 10 years older than you are. Um, but yeah, that's good to know. I think coming out of design school right now, um, we didn't have the Adobe fonts library when we were in design school, kind of my right. generations, like a relatively new thing. We just had the fonts that the school had licensed, you know, um, mm-hmm. and we couldn't then like take those to use in commercial work or anything like that. But, yeah. um, yeah, the landscape has, has totally shifted. And I think the people have kind of spoken and it's like, we, for better, for worse, as users, we like models like Spotify and Adobe fonts. Like it just, it makes sense. It's something we don't have to worry about. Font licensing can be kind of scary and confusing if you're yeah. new to it. Um, I don't think it has to be, but I think a lot of people are freaked out by it and they don't want to get sued for infringement on that stuff and so using adobe fonts is one way to avoid that if you're kind of at that scale and i also think uh, for font users that love something like love a foundry or kind of keep going back to the same foundry on adobe fonts should really pay attention to that and think about like you know if if we're going to continue with the music and spotify metaphor there is streaming the artist 
and then there's going to the concert, mm. you know? Yeah, and or buying artists, the vinyl or whatever. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and artists are, right now are making so much more money through those sorts of things. So I think right. if you have kind of your favorite foundry and then you have a client that then needs to license this and, and own the fonts and stuff mm. like, or own the license to the fonts, then uh, that's a that's a great way that like, fans of a foundry can show their support in a really meaningful way that makes a big difference for foundries. Right. Yeah. I, I, I believe that I, I was, um, reading, I think, a, a, I think it was on Twitter. You were talking about the importance of like owning your, um, I guess work and assets and things. And like, I think it was a comment on the Nike thing. <laughs> yeah. And I was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was curious, like, I saw someone say like something along the lines of, well, yeah, dude, like you just make thoughts or whatever. Like how right, do we do right. that with like a logo or a, you know, right. freelance work? How would you, um, great. you know, maybe approach doing that with like something that's not an actual product per se like that? It's a great question. Okay. So the backstory on this is the classic Nike story. The person who designed the Nike swoosh and the original Nike logotype, legend has it, got paid $30 for the gig. Yeah. Nike blows up and becomes a multi-billion dollar company, whatever. At some point, Nike goes back to her and was like, hey, you weren't really fairly compensated for this. Here's a bunch of Nike stock. And according to the story, she never sold the stock. So she's she ended up you know getting paid maybe fairly for this uh and they gave her a pin did. i heard where she can go to any nike store oh and just get, get free shoes okay shit. great yeah <laughs> um so my problem with that is that um as designers we put brand design on a pedestal for some reason I think it's kind of a trendy uh, genre of graphic design right now is yeah. is branding identity work. And we're at a point in our just general world culture that there are thousands of new brands every day. You know, it's just like we are getting bombarded with branding everywhere we look. Yeah. So there's a lot of branding work happening. That it, there's a lot of branding graphic design needed. And it's just this kind of thing that we've deemed cool. Um, so branding work, usually the way it goes is if you're working on a logo or something, it you the designer doesn't own the logo and the designer doesn't sell a license uh, of use to the um, brand to use the logo. The designer would do the, work for hire thing, which means yeah. that they're going to work and then the company is going to own everything that they create, which is obviously in the company's best interest and maybe not in the designer's best interest. So the question becomes, like you said, how does a graphic designer retain the rights to their own work? And one option is to not do work for hire, but then that would kind of take you out of the branding world. Right. Mm. Um, so honestly, I don't think there is a great example of a way to work for brands that is not work for hire. If you're if you're thinking about a holistic kind of branding project that like starts with a logo and ends up into yeah. a full kind of uh, brand guidelines kind of thing. Um, but the way that we're starting to make it work for us is we will do the exploratory for you. And we own 100% of the exploratory. All the sketches and all of the uh, directions, all of that is ours until a direction is chosen. And then you have the option to buy a license to that if you want to. And when it's a custom typeface, they can buy uh, exclusivity from us. You know, They can say, we want to be, be the exclusive sole license holder to this typeface for one year, mm. three years, five years, or in perpetuity. But at the end of the day, they're still just buying a license to use the thing. I don't know why 
selling logos couldn't operate like that. But um, I think brands are just not used to it. You know, I think it's fear too. like the you can easily be mad with the situation, which is OK, well, we'll just get this guy to do it then, or whatever, you know, because right, I've had yeah. a, I've done an album art project or I had a. a a, uh, we were in the phases of talking money and everything. And then I told the person, cause I was feeling inspired by some of these conversations I've had with people and trying to own more rights and things. And I was saying mm -hmm. like, okay, well here's the album art, but like, I'm not gonna, they were under the impression that they were going to be able to use that for all this merch and this mm -hmm. and cassette mm -hmm. and CD. And I was like, no, this is just for the digital and the vinyl release. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, never mind, you know, we need all that. And I was like, mm -hmm. of course you want all of that because you're going to make 10 times as, as much money off of this now. But sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think maybe the approach that is, is you just have to be comfortable with losing more in the bid or whatever. And Well, uh, yeah, I think the more fight you give on um, trying to uh, asset ownership or whatever, the more mm -hmm. it makes you look unattractive to the client right that's yeah. probably what's going on there they're like ah we'll just find someone that will do it and give us license to all this stuff for free or right. not even bring it up you know basically um but the other thing to keep in mind is to understand what is the goal of the project for you if you're working with a small artist to do a uh, you know an album cover what's what's the point is is it for you to make as much money as you can from this project or is it for you to explore this new kind of mm. aesthetic or something you're looking to try or maybe you're just That's asking true. yourself like do i even like doing album art projects or do i like working with musicians normally um because if if the goal is not to get the most money that you can maybe you are flexible on that stuff and maybe you're just doing yeah. it for some sort of creative enrichment at the end of the day. And then there's at the other end of the spectrum, all these sorts of projects where it's like, okay, it's not the most interesting or rewarding kind of work, or I don't get to exercise my own creativity in the same way. And so this one I am looking for to be the money maker and actually to mm. pay the bills and keep the lights on for me. And I'm That's gonna price point. that accordingly. But just to understand like, What's the real point of this? You know, why yeah. why am I interested in this project? I don't think it's it, it's maybe the best strategy to look at this like tiny indie band and say like, oh, I'm gonna get as much money as I possibly can. Out. First of all, they don't have any, you know, so that's gonna be an uphill battle. They probably haven't gone through the design process before and kind of understand how IP ownership even works you know so it just yeah. seems like you're swimming upstream whereas if you're going to have that conversation with a a larger brand or maybe just an agency that does a ton of brands all the time and they're hiring you as a freelancer or whatever like they've seen it all and they're very used to those sorts of conversations they can kind of work with you but man i don't know how how designers that just do work for bands like there's a lot of them um yeah I don't know how they make that work. It sounds really hard. Yeah, this was a, a, this was a, I appreciate the, um, like, I agree with the smaller thing. Like, obviously they're not going to, but this was like a Big label. They, they, they knew it. They knew they could have figured it out. You know what I mean? Type of thing to afford it or whatever. But I have done it the other way with, you said with the branding where I say like, um, here's, we do all this, but you don't own any of the prior like versions and drafts and like all the, you See, know, I love concept that. one, concept two, because I, then I can use some of those icons or something for like a future project or whatever. Yeah. Or, you know, make templates or, yeah, or, yeah. or, or make resource packs or texture packs and brush packs and like all these other things that are, that become products. I think a lot of times, uh, designers kind of roll their eyes at that kind of side of the graphic design economy, you know, like all this stuff on creative market or whatever. And, yeah. and, and think that like selling mock-up templates or something is kind of like beneath them. Maybe it is, but there's a lot of people that are making a, a great living 
out of that sort of thing. Right. And selling a digital product of any kind is something I would love for people to at least try and and see because it's like, for me, been a totally awakening experience. Selling an educational course or something like that, um, it's it's all good. And to me, that's way cooler than working on a brand. You know, mm. but that's that's just my own kind of personal taste. Like if you can sell a digital product that you own and you can sell it on repeat, like that's so much cooler than branding, right? Right. And it's infinite, you know, it's infinitely scalable, especially with digital products. It's pretty easy for us to scale a, 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 a PNG or a font file rather than a <laughs> actual, you know, you're selling like a sign or like a fucking whatever a computer exactly. or something. Exactly. And, and because it is, you know, the market is flooded for sure. And right, there's, right. there's just a ton of stuff like that. But I am of the opinion that there's always room for more people that are going to do it in a cool way or an interesting way that maybe hasn't been done before, or it's just a reaction to what's happening right now, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so just not to let the idea that like, oh, this is corny or this feels kind of lame, um, stand in the way of, of you doing a cooler version of the same thing, you know? Right. Yeah, I agree. I, I wanted to, um, two, two last things I wanted to ask you. The first one's pretty simple. Uh, how do you feel about the pr properness or whatever of people saying like typeface and font and oh, like don't people care. correcting people don't, <laughs> on that? I don't care. I know language and semantics do matter in certain things, but I really do not care. I think it's okay. way more important just to communicate. Sure. Okay. I think that's a, I like that answer. And then last, uh, question. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could kind of go back, you say you're 34, right? So yep. if you could go back to your 18 year old self, just getting started design and everything, what do you think you would tell them now after as some maybe advice after all the things that you've learned along the way? Um, I think looking at the last 10 years, this probably like 95% terrible work. And, um, but at the time it, it was fun for me to make it, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that the best thing for people at that stage uh, to keep in mind is just to have as much fun as you can with it and, and don't be kind of too hard on yourself because if you're having fun, you'll do it more and if you do it more mm. you will get good at it like it's just a lot it's like gravity the more time you put in it's just a linear graph you know what i mean mm -hmm. so an outrageous amount of time has to be put in and you have to be possessed and obsessed about it to to get there so it's just finding what you can to um enjoy about it and and yeah the other thing is save your money <laughs> it's like <laughs> if you do that alongside saving 20 percent of your income if you want to be aggressive 30 percent or more of your income starting when you're young makes such a big difference so yeah um i think to just kind of keep in mind like like what's important like to pay yourself first you know save your money and pay yourself first and understand mm -hmm. that there is a ton of time that you are going to need to put into your craft before you're going to get it to a place where you like the stuff that you're making. Awesome. That was some great advice. And again, James, I appreciate you coming on. It was great chatting with you. It's great chatting with you too, Jesse. Thank you so much for having me on. Yep. And you can check out James uh, on Ono Type Co, and Ono Type Adobe Fonts. Go buy his fonts, social media, all that stuff. And we'll see you next time. Peace out, everybody.